On October 25, Blue Origin and Sierra Space announced plans for Orbital Reef, a commercially developed, owned, and operated space station to be built in low Earth orbit. Blue Origin describes the station as a mixed-use business park that will provide companies with the infrastructure to open new markets in space. This includes reusable space transportation and an open system architecture that allows users to scale up their use of the station as needed, with features such as modulated berths, vehicle ports, utilities, and amenities set to grow with the market. The 32,000 square feet station introduces modules featuring large earth-facing windows and distinct quarters for living and working. Recreation opportunities and medical care will also be provided to support visits of any length. The station will also have out-of-this-world research facilities and robotic servicing. Orbital Reef's elements are planned to be launched by the new Glenn rocket currently being developed by Blue Origin, while the Boeing Starliner is planned to provide crew transportation services to the station. Sierra Space is planned to provide node and life modules, as well as the Dream Chaser spacecraft for cargo and crew transport. Boeing not only would be tasked with providing Starliner for crew transportation, but also science modules and station operations and maintenance. Several other companies and organizations will also participate in Orbital Reef. The orbital altitude would be higher than that of the International Space Station, and the inclination would be the same as the ISS. The Orbital Reef is expected to begin operations in the second half of this decade. At the same time, it is uncertain when the first element will launch, given the considerable delays experienced by the new Glenn, Starliner, and Green Chaser programs. NASA announced that the agency is now targeting 1.10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on November 3 for the launch of Crew-3 mission to the International Space Station due to a large storm system meandering across the Ohio Valley and through the northeastern United States this weekend. Weather conditions along the ascent corridor are expected to improve for a November 3 launch attempt, and the weather forecast predicts an 80% chance of favorable weather conditions at the launch site. The launch on November 3 would have Crew-3 arriving at the space station later the same day, about 11 p.m. Check out our previous video to learn more about the SpaceX NASA Crew-3 mission to the space station, link in the description. On October 25, during the 72nd International Astronautical Congress held in Dubai, Roscosmos Director General Dmitry Rogozin said he is now satisfied that SpaceX's Crew Dragon is safe enough to carry Russian cosmonauts, clearing a significant roadblock to a seat swap between Soyuz and commercial crew vehicles. Roscosmos had previously said they needed more evidence that Crew Dragon was safe enough for Russian cosmonauts, even after the spacecraft successfully carried NASA astronauts on the Demo-2 mission in mid-2020 and the subsequent Crew-1 and Crew-2 missions. The fact that Roscosmos now has confidence in Crew Dragon does not indicate that a seat bartering agreement between NASA and Roscosmos is a done deal. Following the execution of a formal agreement, the Crew-5 mission in the second half of 2022 would be the earliest a Russian cosmonaut might ride on a Crew Dragon. Similarly, because NASA has decided not to purchase a seat on the Soyuz MS-21 launching in March 2022, the next time a NASA astronaut may ride on a Soyuz would be in the fall of 2022. The all-electric high-throughput communications satellite, SES-17, which weighs around 6,400 kilograms, was launched from French Guiana on an Ariane 5 rocket on October 23, together with the Syracuse 4A communications satellite for the French military. Their combined mass totaled 11,210 kilograms during liftoff. The rocket jettisoned its two spent solid rocket booster casings nearly two and a half minutes into the mission. The main stage kept firing its Vulcane 2 main engine until nearly nine minutes into the mission, before shutting down and plummeting back to Earth off the coast of Africa. An upper stage powered by a hydrogen-fueled HM-7B engine ignited for a 16-minute burn to inject the SES-17 and Syracuse 4A satellites into a geostationary transfer orbit, stretching nearly 36,000 kilometers above the planet. SES-17, the largest satellite ever procured by SES and the largest spacecraft ever built by Thales Alenia Space, will provide internet connectivity to airline passengers across the Americas, the Caribbean, and the Atlantic Ocean. The satellite is expected to reach its 67.1 degrees west orbital slot in mid-2022. SES-17's principal objective will be to serve the aviation business, and it has already taken up in-flight connectivity provider Thales in-flight experience as an anchor customer. The satellite carries a new digital payload controller capable of reprogramming the satellite's nearly 200 spot beams and adjusting power and frequency allocations to respond to changing customer needs. The SES-17 satellite also carries a mechanically pumped loop cooling system, the first such active thermal control loop used on a large commercial communications spacecraft. 
The 3,852-kg Syracuse 4A spacecraft launched along with SES-17 will provide communications services for the French military. This launch helped clear the way for the next Ariane 5 mission to launch the $10 billion James Webb Space Telescope, scheduled for December 18. NASA says a group of scientists may have discovered signs of a new planet beyond the Milky Way, and the potential discovery could be the first ever planet found in another galaxy. The possible exoplanet candidate is located in the spiral galaxy Messier 51, also called the Whirlpool Galaxy, because of its distinctive profile. Until now, astronomers have found all other known exoplanets and exoplanet candidates in the Milky Way galaxy, almost all of them less than about 3,000 light years from Earth. But an exoplanet in M51 would be about 28 million light years away. This new result is based on transits, events in which the passage of a planet in front of a star blocks some of the star's light and produces a characteristic dip. The researchers searched for dips in the brightness of X-rays received from bright X-ray binaries. These luminous systems typically contain a neutron star or black hole pulling in gas from a closely orbiting companion star. The material near the neutron star or black hole becomes superheated and glows in X-rays. Because the region producing bright X-rays is small, a planet passing in front of it could block most or all of the X-rays, making the transit easier to spot. This could allow exoplanets to be detected at much greater distances than current optical light transit studies, which must be able to detect tiny decreases in light because the planet only blocks a tiny fraction of the star. The astronomers published their findings in the journal Nature Astronomy. According to NASA, this intriguing result opens up a new window to search for exoplanets at greater distances than ever before. NASA's overachieving Ingenuity helicopter is flying pretty on Mars once again. The plucky machine logged its 14th flight after chilling out for a few weeks on the Martian surface during Mars Solar Conjunction, a sort of mission vacation that occurs every couple of years when the sun muddies up communications between Earth and the Red Planet. The latest flight, made on October 24, was a relatively small and simple hop designed to test its ability to fly at 2,700 rpm, a rotor speed slightly higher than the regular 2,537 rpm. Moreover, the most recent flight demonstrated the chopper's ability to fly in summer weather conditions on Mars. As the Martian temperature gets warmer, the aircraft's rotors must turn faster to achieve flight. The short 23-second flight included a peak altitude of 5 meters above ground level, with a small sideways translation of 2 meters to avoid a nearby sand ripple. Ingenuity was initially expected to fly only five times on the Red Planet to test whether a powered flight was even possible in Mars' thin atmosphere. However, after its initial success, NASA transitioned to using Ingenuity to scout terrain for the Perseverance rover, and the tenacious helicopter has completed a total of 14 flights. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. After completing two back-to-back -back static fire tests on October 21, SpaceX's first orbital-class Starship prototype, Ship 20, is now preparing for its third static fire test campaign. Barely a full day after that successful back-to-back -back static fire test, SpaceX rolled two more sea-level Raptors to the suborbital pad and installed them on Ship 20. After another unusual week of delay, SpaceX transported two more Raptor vacuum engines from the construction site to the launch site on October 28. The RVAC engines, labeled RV6 and 7, were later installed on Ship 20, thus completing the installation of all six of the ship's engines. Having already fired up two of those engines without needing either replaced, though, there's a decent chance that all six engines of the ship will take part in the next static fire test campaign. SpaceX has never fired more than three engines at a time on a Starship prototype, so, it's uncertain whether the suborbital test stands can withstand the stress of static fires with more than three Raptors, but if they do, Ship 20 will become the first Starship to fire all six engines simultaneously. SpaceX currently has one possible test window scheduled from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Monday, November 1, though if past trends continue, it could be another week or more before Starship 20's next static fire attempt. Speaking about Raptor engines, Elon Musk has revealed that SpaceX recently conducted the first test of an upgraded Raptor engine. According to Musk, the recently tested Raptor version 2 prototype became the most powerful Raptor engine ever tested, gaining about 245 tons of thrust before destroying itself. The engine reached a chamber pressure of 321 bar before exploding, and according to Musk, the cause of the anomaly is most likely due to low oxygen inlet pressure, rather than engine issues. Though impressive, SpaceX has technically pushed Raptor version 1 prototypes further before, hitting a chamber pressure of 330 bar without exploding. 
The key differences between Raptor version 1 and 2 are much cleaner piping and wire harnesses, and a larger combustion chamber throat, which allows the engine to deliver greater thrust at a slight efficiency loss. Booster 4 is currently inactive at the launch site, with no recent test operations. Aside from removing a dozen Booster 4's 29 Raptors, SpaceX began slowly but steadily attaching sections of a steel heat shield designed to protect the engines during ground testing, ascent, and re-entry. Recently some kind of foam was applied around several racks of pressure vessels, hydraulic manifolds, and umbilical connections installed around the booster's base. Those racks will eventually be encased in steel aero covers, which have already been set up next to the booster. It's believed that the foam is being applied for acoustic deadening, which will safeguard sensitive electronics, wirings, and valves from the harsh environment that the booster will produce during liftoff and ground testing. During the early hours of October 28, engineers working at the 145 meters tall orbital launch tower activated the robotic catching arm for the first time. The gigantic claw-like steel structure, dubbed chopsticks by Elon Musk, is designed to grab the Starship and Super Heavy booster as it executes a propulsive landing. The catching arms came alive for the first time on Thursday morning, swinging to the left relative to the tower. This is the first of several movements that the gigantic machinery is expected to perform before it becomes fully operational. Prior to this movement test, SpaceX employees installed hydraulic actuators on the catching arm to facilitate movements. Work is in progress on the draw work mechanism required to raise and lower the booster catching arm. Last week, the launch tower received some of the hefty host blocks necessary to handle the massive catching arm. The next step is to root and reeve hoist wire ropes around the blocks once they've all been fitted. Last week, the Lieber LR11350 crawler crane, nicknamed Frankencrane, which was used to stack the orbital launch tower sections and install booster catching arm and the quick disconnect mechanism, was lowered to the ground, signaling that its work at the starbase has come to an end. Parts of a brand new SpaceX-owned Lieber crane, LR11000, with the SpaceX logo, arrived at Starbase last week. The crane, once assembled, can cover a wide range of jobs with its boom version. The crane has a 1,000-ton maximum load capacity and a 220-meter maximum hoist height. At the tank farm, perlite is being heated in a furnace and injected into the gap between the GSE tanks and cryo shells to insulate the propellants that are going to be stored inside the tanks. Perlite, a naturally occurring amorphous volcanic glass that exhibits low thermal conductivity, is widely used as loose fill insulation for super cold storage and cryogenic tanks. When rapidly heated to the proper temperature, the volatilization of the water, coincident with the softening of the glass, causes the perlite to suddenly expand or pop into lightweight cellular particles or bubbles. These bubbles account for the excellent insulating properties and lightweight of expanded perlite. All four liquid oxygen subcoolers connected to the propellant storage tanks were tested for the first time last week. These shell and tube heat exchangers are used to subcool oxygen below its boiling point. The Booster BN 2.1 test tank, which successfully completed cryo-proof tests on June 8 and 17, was lifted and placed on the booster test stand on October 28. It's unclear whether SpaceX plans to roll out the test tank to the launch site for another cryo-proof test campaign, or whether they were merely performing a fit check. The common dome and aft dome sections of Starship 21 were recently put together. Next, workers will stack the aft dome section and the nose cone sections of the ship to the already assembled sections, thus completing SpaceX's second flight-worthy Starship prototype. The new high bay construction works are progressing, several steel columns and beams were erected last week. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.